Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Sakshi Sethi, and I manage our variety and membership program here at OSA. I'm really excited to introduce today's presentations. It's sponsored by one of our corporate members, VPI Photonics. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to our moderator, Chris Maloney. He's with VPI Photonics to get us started. Um, thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you, Sakshi. So I'm Chris Maloney, uh, Director of Business Development at VPI Photonics. And I'll be moderating and also I'll be providing you with some background for this webinar in which we will hear from our, our two technical experts, Andre Poatinsky and Dr. Onur Dudzgo, who are both uh, applications engineers at VPI Photonics. Again, thank you for joining us today for our talk titled Automated PIC Modeling, a Photonic Neural Network Use Case. So I'll, I'll start us off with a brief introduction and give some background about this webinar before handing it over to our experts. So at VPI Photonics, what we want to do is empower you to define the cutting edge. And so we've been doing this internationally for over 20 years by providing photonic design and analysis software that is integrated, it's interoperable, and it's industry leading. So we have integrated simulation techniques and design functions for devices, components, and systems. Our software is interoperable with many of our partners, simulation, design, and programming software, uh, such as Python, MATLAB, um, Keysight ADS, Mentor Graphics, and, and so on. And it's even interoperable with test and measurement equipment. And we are always seeking industry leading solutions through collaborations with our partners, some of which are actually the inspiration for today's webinar. So I'll uh, mention that a little bit more. Now our, our flagship solution is VPI Photonics Design Suite, which includes both component design and transmission design tools in the same user interface. So we offer tools for the design of fiber-based devices, as well as for photonic integrated circuits. And this is actually where our focus will be today. So if you happen to be working in um, optical transmission systems, let's say for example, for data center interconnects, um, your PIC designs from VPI component maker photonic circuits can simply be used as a building block in VPI transmission maker optical systems. And that's all in the same design environment in, in user interface. Uh, we also offer solutions at various levels of, of abstraction, all the way down to device simulation, as well as for link engineering. So for equipment placement and cost optimized network configuration. But again, today we're going to be focusing on uh, uh, VPI component maker photonic circuits. So, um, so this tool is one that allows for the design and simulation of next generation photonic integrated circuits um, for your ideas for both active and passive devices. And Andre and Owner will describe why this PIC design tool gives you the best of both worlds. So it's both fast and accurate. And it can be used to design um, and optimize uh, circuit parameters, uh, perform sensitivity analysis, and even to study design alternatives. Now, our, our photonic circuit tool is both schematic driven and layout aware. And so of course you can simply use the models included in the software, but it can also accept inputs from device simulators where we can extract uh, device parameters. Um, they can come from PDKs to include foundry specific models. And once you have your schematic and, and you've made some simulations, you can also simply export your design to various layout tools through the click of a button. And lastly, we do include uh, interoperability with some EDA tools um, for electrical simulation or even for electrical optical co-simulation. So some of the inspiration for this talk uh, comes from our contribution to the Impulse project, which supports the, uh, the JEPIX pilot line which offers uh, startup companies, new entrants. Um, it offers them uh, access to uh, the fabrication uh, 
of PIC devices specifically for indium phosphide uh, technology. Um, so one outcome of this project, which we will discuss in more detail today, is our contribution in providing autom uh, automated simulation test benches for both active and passive PICs. Now, our, our contribution to the Plasmoniac project, which aims to use energy and size efficient devices to advance neuromorphic computing, also provides some inspiration uh, for this webinar. So the, the, in this project, um, we'll combine electrical, plasmonic, and photonic devices. devices. But at, at VPI, what we're doing to contribute is we're actually developing a, a plasmonic model library to support this work. Now, we won't be talking about that today, um, but in our use case, we will be centering it around a photonic neural network. So I've, I've just taken you through some of the background and now Andre will join us and he will discuss PIC modeling and specifically uh, simulation and testing methodology. And he'll also give a live demo showing uh, waveguide group index verification methods. Uh, later on, owner will join us and apply what we've learned to a neural network activation unit simulation. So with that, I'd like to hand things over to Andre Thank you. So just as a brief introduction, uh, as thanks for, for your uh, part, uh, I will jump directly to the peak modeling. Uh, whenever we are talking about the peaks, we usually have in mind the fabricated device. However, there are multiple design steps before we can obtain this final chip. And today I will try to focus on these two main aspects, which will cover the simulation and testing of the peak design. So. Let's uh, imagine our chip, uh, our peak, uh, as a fine as a first uh, design based on M uh, MZI example. So MZI example itself is already a device. However, if you would think of the perspective uh, of the design uh, of the designer of the MZI, it is already created from some sub elements. For example, waveguides, X couplers, or ring resonators. Each of such element will have to have representation in the simulation. Moreover, except of this representation of the simulation, there has to be additional uh, adi uh, testing modules like some signal sources and signal analyzers. And today I will present actually focus on such kind of this demonstration showing uh, advanced uh, testing modules. Uh, which were developed in frame of the Impulse project. And this includes actually four modules uh, that I will present here. Uh, it's the waveguide uh, group index extraction and testing uh, modules for modulator, lasers, and SOAs. And just very briefly on the uh, how it would look like on the schematic, we just have a single module that actually is both input and output. So you can see that we have like two output of this module will be just the signal sources, while we also have one input port, which can be visualizer. And actually I can also perform additional characteristics there. And typical uh, extraction figures that we could get from the SOA in this case would be the gain and noise figure. Okay, so to get a brief understanding how the simulation uh, works and are performed in the software, I would like to start with three main steps of the simulation theory for modeling peaks. At first, we need to take a look into the difference between active and passive components. Passives usually does not require driving of the signals and their performance is not changing at the simulation time steps. So there is no change of the behavior within single simulation. Whenever we talk about uh, actives, they usually have some additional electrical driving signal. Moreover, their output characteristic might also change depending on the input signals. This means that we need to take a look into the performance of these modules in any possible time step. To illustrate the problem between the, the difference between these two models, I will just take a look on the two exemplary transfer characteristics. First, for passive structure, we can see that the signal directly fits the, uh, the, our expectation and actually can see already that both on the start at the end of our, uh, of our signal, of our waveform, it's 
contains the uh, proper behavior. So we can see actually that the signal is periodic on the both sides. This means that we will we'll be able to use block mode simulations, which I will explain on the next slide. When we talk about the actives, we can see some distortion of this on the start of the simulation. And this distortion is called as a transient. This transient uh, is actually existing due to the change of the state in active components. This also means that actually our signal is aperiodic, which will explain later on that in this case, we need to use the sample mode simulations. So as a first step from the slide, I would like you to remember that active and passive require different modeling approaches because they have different natures. Okay, so let's get a deeper look what I what is behind the sample mode and time domain and sorry sample mode and block mode. First, when we talk about the samples, we talk about very small simulation steps, usually in a range of picoseconds. While performing the sample mode simulation, in order to observe the changes of the module behavior in time, we need to run each module separately for each time step. So in reality, you will have to execute each module as many times as we have samples. On the other side, if we will talk about the block mode simulation, we have in mind already group of samples that is connected together into a simple uh, block and passed through each modules. This gives us the, the possibility that each of the modules can be evaluated only once. Then we can just pass all the samples through it to the next block and run the next block. This allows us to uh, simulate each block, to ev evaluate each block only once and actually is very efficient in the both results and in the uh, speed of the simulation. So actually, the, uh, this allows us also that we can describe our module in a single S matrix that will just perform the transfer characteristic between the both uh, input and output electrical field. And we have this S matrix that will just be the transformation between them. So as I mentioned, we can uh, describe the uh, passive with the S matrices simulated in frequency domain using block mode signals, while the active has to be simulated in the sample mode signals in time domain. Okay, so let's jump to the example to get into some more details on this. So what could happen if you would like to actually combine simulation of active and passive components in the single simulation? Just on this simple example of this uh, MZI, we can see that if we simulate it in frequency domain, so using this S matrix domain, we can see that the spectrum is totally flat on top. However, if you would like to simulate the same structure in time domain, there is a problem because the samples cannot evaluate the S matrix directly from the passives. Because the S matrix refers to the electrical field, while sample is just the time sample, the part time of the signal only. This means that we need to perform additional filtering on the S matrices. And this is here shown on the picture by this FIR. FIR corresponds to the finite impulse response filters that needs to be performed and to, the, to each S matrix in order to, uh, to be able to understand, to understand this S matrix by the samples. However, each of this filter per, uh, gives additional perturbation to our signal, which actually can be seen mainly on the edges of the bandwidth via this distortion that you can see on the both sides. And this actually might not seem a bit a big problem when we talk only about four components like here. However, if we would think of the situation when you have hundreds of them, this actually already becomes a big problem. And actually, this problem was already presented by Sergei Mingalev in the uh, mentioned paper, in the referred paper here on the bottom, where actually he shows the error based on the number of passives that we, uh, that we are simulating. I don't want to go actually in big details here, uh, how it's performed and how it is uh, how it can be solved. Uh, I will jump directly to the proposed solution, which actually is the hybrid domain. And this hybrid domains allows us to create the combined S matrix from all the passive components and create only single FIR filter. As presented on the box, we have just the box that contains all the passives. And instead of creating four filters, we create only one of them. And uh, 
this method actually is, uh, we can see already that has better performance uh, looking on the figure that we are presenting. So to can conclude, whenever we want to combine active and passive components in a single simulation, we can perform hybrid simulation. In that case, any cluster of passive components will be pre-calculated using S matrices, while time domain simulation will be performed afterwards. An interesting note uh, to such uh, methodology is that it improves not only the performance of the simulated peak, but also it's actually much faster than the standard simulation, uh, time domain simulation. Okay, so let's now jump to, uh, to the live demonstration on which I will uh, present you and try to explain the idea behind the complex testing modules based on the group index extraction from an NZI device. And I will show you some exemplary macros and scripts that can be used for the design automation uh, to present you how such modules could help us performing some more complex simulations. And this will be used to present you the implementation of the WIF variance for uh, emulation of the uh, for the fabrication tolerances. And let me now jump to the representation of our schematic. What we can see here, there is this unbalanced MZI structure. You can see this box around. If we'll simply double click on it, we can see that it's set to S matrix, the simulation domain. So we can expect the, uh, the frequency domain simulation. If we just look on our global parameters that we can access by double clicking on the background, we can see that boundary conditions are set to periodic, exactly the same as the uh, as the presented demonstration. So we can be sure that this will, simulation will be performed in frequency domain. And this is correct because we have purely passive structures here. Moreover, I would like to refer here to the length difference parameter. Length different parameter is just an additional global parameter that has been created, which will actually define the difference in the length between these two arms of the MZI. So we can see that these two middle waveguides are actually, uh, its length is set to length different divided by two. So both of them will refer to our length. And this is quite important because this is also the input for our testing module. I talked about the length difference. It's worth to check also that the width by now is set to 0.4 micrometer for all the modules that we have, all the waveguide structures. This is quite important because as I mentioned, we'll later on want to vary this uh, parameter in order to perform some kind of tolerance analysis. Okay. I also mentioned that we have already some advanced modules to be used. And actually here we have two modules. One is spectrum analyzer and the other is FSR and NGRD extractor. Let me first start with the spectrum analyzer. I don't want to go into details how this module works. For this presentation, it would be enough for you if you will just get information that this module analyzes the spectrum of the peak, so of the spectrum provided by the signal and extracts the information from the minimas and maximas, all the minimas and maximas of the characteristic. Additionally, as I mentioned, we have this magic FS, FSR NGR extractor, which allows us to extract free spectral range and group index information based on this structure. It's actually quite nice to see how it looks because you have the, the peak characteristics which are provided from the spectrum analyzer and there is our length difference that was defined uh, to explain the difference between the arms. If we we'll look inside how the module is built, in reality, we can see that this module is a Python co-simulation galaxy. And if you will take a look, you can see that it's actual interface is really set to Python. And there is the run command that calculates the wavelength, free spectral range and group index based on given function that is described in the Python code here. I don't want to go here into details because it's, uh, it would take us a bit longer than we have time today. However, if someone has questions or want to know more how such scripts can be created or how the script works, we can discuss this afterwards. For now, I would like to just jump back to our example and show the results of such schematic. So we just press run in that case. And we will, in few seconds, we should see the results which will present the characteristic of this MZI. You can see the whole simulation takes eight seconds. And within the simulation, this FSR NGR module gives us also the values, the calculated values. So let's see how it looks on the, 
on the analyzer, so the results. And here we can see the typical spectra that we would uh, observe looking on the MZI. And we can also observe the free spectral range versus wavelength, as well as the calculated uh, group index. However, there is one still problem that we were discussing. So it's nice. We, however, we would like to use this approach into more complex uh, calculations, to more complex simulations. For this, actually, I prepared a script, uh, which is called here as an init file, which actually allows us to define some kind of the function dependence, which will just take two parameters. One is the width, the other is the difference of the width. And actually, it will apply for this, uh, as an output of this function, it will apply the given width value with this difference with multiplied by some number uh, random value. So this function just gives us the value, random value between zero and one in order to investigate the tolerances. And here again, we come out with some uh, magic macro that is pre-created and used for anyone in the software, which actually will allow you to look on the modules that has given parameter and change it. For this, it's just the width. So this macro will look for all the parameters that has width. In that case, it's uh, our all waveguide structures and set its width. If we'll simply double click it to run it, we can see, we can set now the desired value that was 0 0.4 and apply some tolerance. So by this, we will apply the value of the 0 0.1 uh, micrometer variation to this value. And if we mark the box, it will also change for every run we are doing. Okay, so when we just simply click finish, you can see that all the modules now have changed its width to this Python function that will evaluate this, uh, this width. Okay, so let's now create additional global parameter, which we could call fabrication instance. and put the default value to one. With this parameter, we can now create a sweep control and actually sweep the value from one to 10. Just by clicking OK, so we have now a sweep which we can run. And what actually the sweep will now perform, it will run our schematic 10 times for 10 different width values. And we will be able to observe the characteristics which are shown on this given pictures. And actually we can see that there is already some kind of the, uh, of the variation in our MZI spectrum. Uh, even though the free spectral range is quite constant, we can see the points. The points are referring to the frequencies of the, of the maximas in our spectrum. They are slightly varying and our calculated group index is also varying. Yes, so with, the, with this method, actually, we can evaluate the fabrication tolerances. However, there is one problem, uh, one main problem behind it. Actually, I just showed it only looking on the width parameter and only on the waveguide width, actually, because this is the only parameter that we can access directly by looking on our PDK modules. However, if we we'll look, for example, on the MMI, the MMI is described by the S matrix, and we do not define the length and width of these modules. And they are always also depending uh, on, the, uh, on the fabrication tolerances. So such approach is very good whenever we want to just vary something we know we can control with the simulation. So we can perform tolerance analysis on the user controlled modules. However, it might not be enough. And actually my colleague Onur will show you a bit uh, nicer approach how such tolerance analysis could be performed and uh, refer where you could get more information on this. So thank you very much on this part and I will give back my voice to my colleagues. Yes, th thank you Andre for that uh, discussion around PIC modeling, specifically the hybrid simulations as well as uh, your, your demonstration there about the waveguide group index uh, verification methods. So now, now we're gonna switch gears. We're gonna turn it over to Owner, who will talk about a neural network activation unit simulation and build upon what Andre was just discussing. So with that, uh, Owner, the, the floor is yours. Okay, um, 
Thanks for introduction. I would like to start my talk uh, with explaining the meaning of hybrid simulation with active and passive modules. Then um, I will show you uh, the, an example of it uh, in all optical simulate activation units. And we will also have a live demo. Okay, as Andre mentioned during his talk, we are um, simulating fully passive circuits in frequency domain and uh, fully active circuits in time domain. The boundary conditions of the simulation and the data type of the optical and electrical sources should be switched accordingly. Um, we, when we talk about hybrid simulation, why? Uh, what do we mean with that? We mean that we have, a, if we have a structure like this, which includes uh, passive devices, as you can see, and an active device, waveguide modulator. Waveguide modulator here is a device produced by using photonics TLM modules. Photonics TLM modules is an uh, advanced uh, simulation module of active devices. I will uh, explain more about them later. But when we have this uh, uh, device, we have to simulate it in time domain. In time domain, um, then you need to switch boundary conditions and data type is shown here. But the passive components here you can see then um, must be, uh, because they are defined with S matrices, we have to uh, apply FIR filters to these passive components. But as Angela mentioned, this might bring some inaccuracies if you have a big peak device, for instance. To solve this problem and um, produce an accurate result, we offer a single S matrix um, for passive circuits and uh, the simulator will produce an FIR filter for this, and uh, the the um, yeah, the filter will produce a, a much better transfer function, and it will be uh, also you can use some transfer function regularization um, tools, and it will be very accurate, and you will not have this um, inaccurate parts at the end of the edges. So uh, you can simulate passives and actives together, and this is how. But, uh, what we call hybrid simulation. Okay, we talked about this waveguide modulators. Let's uh, go into details of photonics TLM modules. As I mentioned, photonics TLM modules are advanced uh, simulation tools for active uh, components. They have, you can see that uh, electrical input and electrical output ports and optical uh, input and output ports. And these are bi-directional ports. So you you can simulate a bi-directional propagation inside the cavity. All these components here, you can see, they are produced by using the single photonics TLM module. They are ready in our uh, module library, but of course you can create your own module. You can, uh, by using photonics TLM module, you can create a multi-section device easily. Uh, when we uh, simulate active components, we are using uh, solving rate equations for electro their electronic subsystem and traveling wave equations for their optical subsystem. Uh, photonics TLM modules uh, have lots of applications. You can see a small list of it. Uh, you can uh, simulate a multi-section component or single section component. They, it can be actives and passives together. Um, uh, and also, you can find lots of different applications of them in application example uh, menu that we have in our user interface. We are creating demos and I, I, I think you will find them very useful for your cases. If you are interested in modeling of multi-section semiconductor lasers, I uh, would like you to, I would like to recommend um, this uh, YouTube uh, video for you. Uh, you can find it in our uh, BPF Photonics YouTube channel. And there are also other very uh, useful uh, videos. Uh, I strongly recommend you if uh, you are interested in our products and applications. Okay, after explaining hybrid modulation, hybrid simulation and uh, active devices, I would like to now um, show you an example of uh, hybrid simulation. Uh, it's an all optical sigmoid activation unit. Uh, this is the structure. It is a uh, proposed by uh, Wimpos group from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. It's a very productive group, very good group. We are collaborating for Plasmoniac uh, project. Uh, here I am uh, leaving the reference for this paper and this paper uh, demonstrates the first example of a sigmoid uh, optical neuron 
that uh, generates the weighted optical summation of uh, AWDM optical signal. And this is the activation unit structure they are using. Um, this uh, structure includes a deeply saturated differentially biased SOA MZI followed by a cross gain modulation wavelength converter. I will uh, show how you can create such a schematic on VPI design suites. We will discuss about this hybrid uh, simulation. Then I will show you how you can do the characterization of active and passive uh, components. Finally, I will show you the transfer function of this uh, activation unit. And we will talk about a new method, uh, Andrew already mentioned, mentioned for um, investigation of the effect of fabrication tolerances. I can now switch to our design suite. Here you can see our uh, design suite. Uh, this is the schematic I created uh, to simulate such structure. You can see that it's a, a, a typical hybrid uh, simulation. Uh, we have passive components here. We have active components here and uh, here as well. But as we have um, active photonics TLM based SOAs, we have to simulate this simulation in time domain, which means that boundary conditions must be set as a periodic and the output data type of optical and electrical um, uh, sources must produce samples uh, data in samples mode. Um, when you would like to um, switch between like simulation um, uh, domains like time domain or frequency domain, you do not need to worry about all these, uh, uh, for instance, sources and their data type. We are actually um, carrying out an automated modeling uh, of these uh, uh, devices. So when you would like to switch between the time, uh, between the uh, simulations, you can say set time domain simulations here, or if you would like to simulate fre in frequency domain, you can go for set frequency domain simulations. If I click on set time domain simulations, the design suite brings uh, me a new window. You can define your global parameters here. And there is an interesting <coughs> box here. It says create virtual galaxies. What does this mean? Why do we need virtual galaxies? I, let me to explain. When we need to simulate uh, passives and actives in hybrid simulation in time domain, you can actually put these passive uh, components in this virtu we call virtual galaxies to create single uh, S matrices, S matrices, S matrix for uh, one uh, virtual galaxy. If you double click on it, you can see that you can uh, define the digital filters parameters. I mentioned that we also can do the transfer function regularization. Uh, it's also here. Maybe we don't need for this specific case because it's a very simple structure, but for many cases, you will need it and it will provide you the best fitting options. Um, and also you need to add logical delay between um, and these modules because this is a bi-directional propagation. And uh, if you don't have a logical delay between them, it, you will have a deadlock, you cannot simulate. And the simulation of these passives will be in S matrix. So you can actually, by doing this, you can actually make them ready for simulation. And, uh, but okay, you have the structure ready in front of you for simulation, but you also want to understand that if these passive circuits or these active devices are set correctly. So you need to do a characterization. This characterization also can be done very easily by using our. Uh, design suite, we uh, have automation tools for them ready for you. Say you would like to characterize this passive uh, device. You need to just single uh, click on them and go to macros. And you need to select characterize passive circuits. When you press on it, you will see that design suite automatically created a new uh, uh, setup for us. We, do, we just have the uh, modules in front of us. We selected these modules. We would like to do the characterization by using these ports. These numbers are port numbers, actually. Okay, the, there is also a tool here, characterization tool, and I just need to define the <clears throat> input port. The, I want to say, use the first port as an input port, and the polarization, T, is good for me. And uh, I would like to see the output in the port um, number six. And the polarization will be again TE polarization. When you 
click on visualize transfer function button here, you will see that our design suite immediately, immediately fill the ports as we would like to uh, use. We said first port for input, so it uh, connected the impulse, optical impulse generator here, and there is also a, a analyzer connected to the output ports. And the, all the rest, they are not left empty because it won't work. It's, uh, it's filled with a dummy load. So you don't need to do, you don't need to worry about how to set this uh, schematic. It's automatically done by the design suite. Here we can look at the, uh, before going to analyzer, I would like to say that this function, uh, in, in this uh, optical impulse generator is sending a zero dBm uh, optical power to the whole, um, for whole um, bandwidth, simulation bandwidth. And this is the transfer, this is the transfer function of this uh, uh, passive circuit. So we can see that around six dBm uh, uh, response we have. This is a, of course, a simple structure only with MMIs. Uh, but if you have your own MMI uh, um, your own MMI uh, design, or if you have more passive circuits with uh, micro ring resonators, for instance, uh, you will see that this is actually a very useful uh, tool, and it saves a lot of time. Okay, now we can go back to our schematic and uh, talk about how to characterize SOAs. We, we have to follow the same uh, routes. We have to single click on SOA and go to macros and select characterize SOA because we are characterizing an uh, SOA. It could be a laser or modulator. It depends on what you would like to characterize. In our case, it is an SOA. So when I click on it, Design Suite again uh, created a new setup and it brought us the component we wanted to characterize. And it added this uh, module here, which is which is called test set SOA. This test set SOA has electrical uh, one electrical output, uh, one uh, optical uh, output, and optical input. We can look at the uh, parameter editor of this test set um, SOA. Uh, here you can define define how many runs you would like to ignore because you would like to remove all this transition period how many runs you would like to uh, use for analysis this depends on your um, time window and uh, you you can have uh, more runs to have accurate uh, uh, output and here we have two um, char characteristics you can calculate the gain and noise figure and if you would like to only see, for instance, gain, you can turn the other one off. Here we have three parameters, input signal powers, input signal frequencies, and injection currents. You can sweep any of them um, to see the characteristics to response of this SOA. In this case, we are keeping input signal frequencies and injection currents as constant values, and we are sweeping input signal powers. Uh, this is There's a list here from minus 20 dBm to 20 dBm with two dBm step, but you can actually introduce, um, I don't know, ranges for frequencies, for instance. Uh, for this um, simulation, I would like to just keep it as it is and uh, run the simulation. It doesn't take very long time. We will see the uh, uh, characteristics of SOA for given uh, uh, values. Okay, we got the output. Here you can see that uh, this, uh, this typical SOA uh, has uh, for given parameters, this is how gain is changing with increasing power, and this is how noise figure is changing with increasing power. But uh, of course, if you would like to increase the, for instance, the accuracy or like uh, if you would like to uh, try some tests for specific ranges, you just need to go to test it SOA and make your modifications. It's very straightforward. And we have this, uh, this kind of modules for lasers, for modulators, I, as I showed before. So everything is automated. You do not need to worry about how to do these things. Okay, I'm closing this and we return to our uh, optical sigmoid activation unit here. As I mentioned, we have a, a SOA MZI, and here we have a cross gain modulator, and I, uh, I carried out the character characterization of this uh, schematic by 
increasing the input power and detecting the output power. It is, these are simple post-processing tools to plot the output. Uh, if you would like to learn more about this design, I suggest you to um, check the paper I referred. Um, the simulation, this simulation will take around 10 minutes. Uh, I can uh, show you the outputs, they are ready. I have them already uh, here. You can see that we have um, in linear scale, uh, scale and logarithmic scale, we have the transfer function of the activation uh, unit. This obtain activation, uh, sorry, transfer function of activation unit uh, has uh, almost an excellent uh, fitting to the mathematical expression of the logical sigmoid function. We use this uh, activation unit in our uh, upcoming uh, paper. I will mention it soon. Uh, we created the optical neural network and we use uh, this uh, um, actual activation unit there. Uh, so uh, it, uh, we use the fitting, of course, uh, by using the sigmoid, um, uh, mathematical expression of a sigmoid function. So it works quite well. Now I would like to return to my slides and talk about the fabrication tolerances. Okay, in Andre's example, he um, carried out the investigation on activate fabrication tolerances by taking the user-defined parameters into account only. Uh, I can understand that uh, it's not, uh, it's not a, enough for realizing a more uh, realizing a realistic or accurate fabrication tolerance analysis but most of the time we are restricted with um, foundry's intellectual intellectual property uh, uh, issues and they are this is very normal but we brought a new method to actually um, carry out this fabrication uh, tolerances analysis in Andre's case, remember that we didn't uh, have chance to apply fabrication tolerances analysis to the MMIs because there wasn't uh, almost anything, any parameter ready to uh, sweep, uh, uh, investigate like user-defined parameter. But uh, we actually, uh, by uh, using our method, we uh, could do it for our uh, activation unit example. We, what we did, what what we are doing for, uh, with this new method we are actually uh, taking the statistic uh, statistical variation of critical device parameters into account this uh, when you create a pdk with vpi and uh, if you are a foundry you can actually uh, provide us your um, simulation results or characterization results of this produce uh, devices and we can um, create a mathematical um, model for this, uh, the variation of this um, fabrication tolerances, the effects of this, um, sorry, the effect of critical device parameters on the, 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 the fabrication tolerances. By doing this, uh, you can protect your foundry's um, intellectual property and plus your users, our PDK users will benefit uh, from this, um, statistical uh, model and you can see that we just uh, applied uh, some statistical model to our MMI's uh, uh, device parameters and we uh, simulated uh, it with fabrication tolerances on for 100 time and you can see how much actually uh, the output power of the activation units for one level and zero level can change within the fabrication tolerances. Uh, if you are interested in this uh, analysis, I recommend you to follow our talk, upcoming talk at SPIE Photonics West the conference. Uh, we are explaining this method well there. We are giving more ex um, examples and our uh, manuscript will be published soon as well. Uh, I uh, can tell you that it is starting, uh, the, the our presentation will be available on demand starting from 6th of March, uh, and you will also be uh, shown. You, we will also show the the optical neural network example, including the activation unit as well. This is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Yes, thank you, owner, for that talk and discussion around the all optical sigmoid activation unit and for that uh, teaser about fabrication tolerances. So be, be sure to check that out at Photonics West. Um, so so that, that concludes the, the webinar, uh, the, the technical discussion. 
Um, so uh, please, if, if you have some interest and you want to chat with somebody, you can contact us and we can give you a free demonstration and software evaluation. So please feel free to reach out to us. Um, but yeah, thank you for your attention, for your time. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Andre and Onar for a great presentation. There is a email um, on the screen, sales at bpiphotonics.com. If you have any other additional questions or comments or concerns, definitely uh, feel free to send that their way. Um, and I hope to see you all in the networking room. So thank you guys again for attending and see you guys at the next one.